Hi guys, it's Dom here from Sounds Fair. Just had the wonderful opportunity to chat to John Rob about his new book, The Art of Darkness. Of course, we talked about Louder Than War, we talked about Goldblade, we talked about the membranes, all of his musical projects, creative inspirations, and so, so much more. Thank you to John for his time, and thank you to you guys uh, for watching this. Don't forget to check out The Art of Darkness. I'll put a link in the comments and everything uh, else. Uh, but yeah, thank you for listening, thank you for watching. However you are consuming this, uh, check out out the out of darkness and support john rob loud than war and all of his uh, other awesome projects across the music industry and arts and culture as well uh, thanks for watching thanks for listening cheers john it's a pleasure to see you again after so many years um you've got a lot going on mate how have you been? Uh, you know, I, I I could go and list off your accomplishments with the band stuff, gold plate, all that thing. But you've got so much going on. So how are you, mate? How have you been? Uh, pretty busy in the last uh, few weeks, just because a bit of book. I mean, I'd spend the last six months getting the edit done, then get it out because of self-releasing the book as well. It's it's very much the spirit of punk rock DIY because it was going to come out in a big book company, but we didn't see eye to eye over the way the book should be. So I thought, why, why am I even arguing about this? You know, because I do come from DIY world and I'm still a firm believer that you could create your own art and, and you shouldn't really, I mean, good advice is good, isn't it? But if you, don't, if you think, well, actually, I don't agree with what you're saying, then do it yourself, you know? I mean, and I'm in a position where I could do that because I can organise myself to get things done. And it's been much more efficient. It's been quicker. Uh, we've got it licensed off around the world. I mean, it's just, just been totally on it to get the thing out and it's, I mean, it's it's, it's pretty uh, intense, but at least at least it gets done on your terms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I do want to talk about Art of Darkness, the book, of course. That is, you know, something you are plugging at the moment. But one thing I've always uh, loved about you, mate, and respected is your work ethic. And, you know, because you're always doing something, man. And it's honestly, you know, great to look at. You've always got something going on. So how long have you had that work ethic for? Has that always been something way before the bands, you know, ever since you were younger, have you always had that work ethic, that DIY attitude, effectively? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it came out of punk rock, didn't it, really, the idea that, uh, of DIY, which and also DIT, doing it together. But that idea that you didn't have to wait for other people to give you permission to make your culture, which is such a, I think, is actually the revolution in punk rock, you know, and I think too often maybe in, in music and, and in culture, people wait till somebody lets them do something. And um, I mean, it, was, it wasn't like we were starting off in a, in a luxury position. I mean, we had a clue what we were doing, but we still went and did it anyway, you know. And I think that's, that's a great learning curve on its own, you know, just just making all the mistakes, because they're not really mistakes, are they? They're just different interpretations of what you're meant to do. And, and I've, that's, I mean, obviously, sometimes you you put records out of proper labels or you write for proper magazines or papers and that, or put books out on, on big book companies. But that DIY background always means that you always have a fallback, you know. And if you really believe in something and the way it sounds or reads or whatever it has to be, it can come out like that. You know, it's, it's not like I need a big company, book company to say it's meant to be like that. You know, it's, I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm actually not wrong here. I'm not being big edited, but it actually works the way I've got this, you know. So that's how I did it. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I think that's, you know, it's it's a great, you know, sort of, again, you mentioned that punk spirit there, which I think is amazing. And obviously, you know, you've been such an integral part of, of punk and punk culture in the UK uh, for many, many years, but also now with the book, The Art of Darkness, you know, uh, the first comprehensive overview of goth music and culture. Now, again, I, I know you have an understanding and you've got all these wonderful interviews that you've done in the book, but what, what was the... The catalyst for it. Can you take me back to the moment you decided to to pile on to your already mega schedule <laughs> and do this book? What was it the you know what were the inspirations? Tell me about that. The genesis of the idea, where it came from. I think a lot of it was. Um, I read a lot of books about post punk, and a lot of them are great books, but they, they seem to um, narrow down what post punk was. It, it, it seems to be coming just a clutch of bands. And that, the way I remembered it, sort of growing up through it, there, there was more to it than that. And bands like Bauhaus or Killing Joke or all those groups were kind of dismissed and just pushed to the side when really they may... I mean, the fans know it, so it's, there's no point preaching to convert it. But to, the other, to everybody else, you know, that I wanted to tell people to celebrate these bands as some of the greatest art rock bands this country's ever produced. And just because they're a bit flash and dressed up, to, to negate their art, you know, there's always that thing that 
you know, like a genius athlete like Brian Wilson or something. You know, it's you know, Mark Boland was as much of a genius as anybody, but just because um he was a teeny bop idol doesn't mean he wasn't the great one of the greatest songwriters this country's ever produced. And the same thing replicated in Goth as well, I think to a certain extent. You know, I think there was a tendency to think Peter think maybe it's a bit too flash for his own good or something. Now people didn't really get to people didn't really understand it either, you know. I, I thought it was important to try and unpack it, you know. And when you unpack it, it is quite fascinating. I mean, one of the first things that's really fascinating about it is that none of the bands consider themselves as goth bands because goth was actually a retrospective term for a scene that was already there. You know, it was called alternative music. I mean, before that, it was called raincoat bands. I, I remember The Cure and Joy Division, that's what people used to call them because they used to wear raincoats and be slightly gloomy. <laughs> yeah, man. I think that's the thing. Is It's like... You know, you mentioned there that some of the bands didn't necessarily associate with the term. And I read in an interview that you did recently that you spoke to there's people you spoke to, like Severin, for example, who didn't necessarily identify with that term. So was there any sort of discoveries that you made? I'm not saying that you think you don't, because obviously, you know, you'll know a lot of stuff about punk and goth and alternative music in general because of your career and what you've done. Was there any interesting discoveries you got? from the newer interviews you did for this book and from, you know, from doing it, what did you learn about the culture that you didn't necessarily know before? I think it was more than just the unpacking of it, really, and the yeah. details of it. And I, I just wanted to underline certain things. I mean, there was a sort of school of thought that, you know, goth is the whitest music ever, but it's not at all, <laughs> actually. It's, it's it's really influenced by a lot of black music. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like, sort of disco, uh, funk and dub are really big influences on goth. You know, it's a space of dub is all over goth. You know, the music isn't as claustrophobic and full as punk. You know, it's mm. there's a space in the sound. But also because a lot of it is about the dance floor, because one of the prime purveyors of the culture was goth clubs, which are up and down the UK. It had to be, you had to be able to dance to it. So to dance to it, you have to be able to understand uh, disco or funk, you know, I mean, it's it's not it's not like a direct take of disco and funk, but it's an understanding of the nuance and the flexibility of the rhythms of of those kinds of music. They're mixing it with the intensity of punk, and then also, um, you know, the adventure of glam as well. I mean, glam's a really important influence. I think if you if you're going to boil down goth to simple X plus Y equals chemical equation, it's kind of like Jim Morrison plus David Bowie. Uh, plus uh, punk equals goth. You know, I mean, there's other things feeding in, but that's a simplistic way of sort of summing up the prime kind of streams that are feeding into it. Mm, mm. It's a really, I've never heard it quite as succinct as that, John. I love it. That's that's great, man. Uh, I appreciate the uh, the summary. I think a lot of people will get something out of that. Um, you know, I know it's obviously with Goldblade over the years, you've obviously had the post punk elements to you know to, to to the hardcore punk elements and different things like that. To what extent have you yourself been? Because, you know, I guess it's a deeper question around image. You know, you've always had a very strong image and, and you know, very, very, very cool and very stylized. Um, to what influence, you know, what influence have you yourself in your career, musically and otherwise, taken from goth and goth culture? Uh, you know, I can say, you know, perhaps the image and stuff, but that's just my perception as a, as a fan. So, you you know, directly, what, what, what have you yourself taken from goth culture in your own career? I think a lot of people kind of growing up in that period and, you know, mm. going to clubs and going to the gigs. I don't think there was a thing where everybody decided... I mean, this is the thing, that's why most people in that period of time don't think of themselves being goth, because it wasn't called goth for two years. And I think um, it, it just seemed like a logical uh, journey out of punk. So the style was more exaggerated than punk, that people's hair got longer and sort of stuck up higher, you know. <laughs> There was more things you could get, you know, it was easy to get clothes you couldn't get in the punk days. And the looks became darker because black is a very attractive colour to wear. Everyone looks good at black. And uh, I don't think it was, it, initially it wasn't like, you know, a dress code. There was no dress code. It was just a logical, getting, sort of getting more freaky version of punk, really. You know, like there was more. There's, there's more extras you could buy. You could start, you could get rings, but you couldn't buy rings in 77. They're really hard to get outside the big cities and things, you know, and like belts and sort of belts and all those kind of things that look quite gothy. You know, a lot of it was homemade initially because you just couldn't get it, you know. Like, I remember when Brian Gregory from the Cramps came over the first tour and people tried to get bone jewellery. I mean, I know Vivian Westwood has sold it, 
in 76. But I mean, I mean, nobody I knew from Blackpool went to live in Westwood. It's too far away. It's like, it wasn't like nowadays. You can go to these places. So people used to make themselves out of papier mache. So a lot of stuff is very homemade and very, you know, then shops started to appear. We could get things. And that kind of pushed the look along a bit as well. But there's also an element of invention, you know, and it was it was DIY style. A lot of second-hand mm. clothes as well, you know, a lot of Oxfam, but just repurposing it into, like, different shapes. Learning how to stitch, not particularly well, but learning how to stitch and make clothes that, you know, getting certain clothes and making look like other clothes and things as well. So a lot of imagination and a lot of nudging along in the same direction, but no sense of doing that to join a scene, you know, I think it was. I think in, in a way it was. It's kind of like discovering an animal and giving it a name. You know, the animal's already there, isn't it? Yeah. Or discovering America. You know, when people discovered America, there's already three million people living there. I mean, it, the Native Americans didn't become Native Americans. They 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 already were native. They already had an intense culture of their own, anyway. You know, so it's kind of like a little cultural version of that. You know, but is that maybe that's true of all kind of pop cultures? You know. And the only danger is that when they do get discovered, they get instantly codified, you know, what you're meant to listen to, what you're meant to look like, what you're meant to be. And that really annoys people as well, doesn't it? You know, because that freedom of creativity you get in the early days of scenes are like when the scenes are at their most exciting, isn't it? Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? People have to classify things with a genre. It makes makes people's jobs easier, but then it sometimes takes away from the the creativity because people need to classify things. I think it's a wider conversation, of course. Oh, of course, on the other hand, if you're trying to describe something, you haven't got all night to describe all the details of it, have you? So sometimes you're doing your shorthand word and that's what was handy about goth because in the end, it is actually quite a good word for it. And because, because if you think of goth and gothic and gothic art, which is in the book and gothic literature, mm. it, it's definitely the prelude to it, you know? And if you, once you... Once you put that lineage in it, then then you realise that the word gothic maybe isn't so bad after all. Mm. But if 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 it's going to have parameters, then it's a problem. But if it's just a shorthand for a feeling, or a style, or 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 a, or a piece of music, then it's quite it's handy, you know. But you should never um, you should never sort of think it's a be all and end all. It's just it's just a, it's just a quick shorthand for something. Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly is attractive. And um, you know, before we talk a lot, a little bit about you know sort of ways that you've been inspired in your career and, and ways that other people have been inspired, you know, by perhaps some of your work. Um, I, I wanted, to, wanted to ask you about some of the most enjoyable parts of pulling together this book and, and, and getting it getting it done, getting it to the point now where you're, you know, obviously it's coming out in a few days, uh, you're not, you know, particularly, you know, you're thinking about taking it out to, to America and things like that. So what, what will be some of the most enjoyable memories you take away from from building this book, whether it's the interviews, obviously the photos, things like that, very visual. Um, what are the things that are going to stick with you uh, alongside everything else that you've done with your career? I think the, the fascination of the deep dive, you know, because I, I think there's a problem I had with the book covers because they didn't want the book to be so long. And they were saying, could you well make it shorter? But for me, you could just dredge all that information on your own on Wikipedia. You know, what's the point of that? So you need something in the book that's deeper. It's got more things in it, you know, and it, and going down all the rabbit holes is fascinating, you know. So, get you know, I mean, obviously I knew quite a bit about the, the sort of gothic literature and arts, but to actually really go into the detail of it was really interesting. And also to kind of, you know, sort of suggest that, you know, those people like Baudelaire or or Lord Byron were, were kind of, you know, the Nick Cays or the Robert Smiths of their day, you know, the people embracing... Uh, really profound ideas, you know, like, you know, the, the key tenets of goth, you know, sex and death, you know, the, the really heavy stuff in life, you know, or, you know, the, the stuff that makes us human, isn't it, you know, uh, and be able to embrace those, but not in a way that you wallow in it. So, and, and melancholy as well, the dark side is fascinating, uh, but you don't, you don't drown in it, you know, it's, it's, it's something, and what, what's that great saying? If, if you don't embrace death, you couldn't, you can't, uh, you can't, Oh, what the hell's the it's, saying? Isn't it? Yeah, you... I, I was going to say embrace life, but I don't know the saying. So yeah, yeah, so embrace twice. It, it, it feels like yeah, it feels like embrace life or something. I don't know. It, that's it. You just came the right word there. If you don't fear death, you can embrace life. It's something like that as well. So you know that thing about you know the fascination of death and understanding death. Yeah. But, and once you get that, you know life is. You know you can really feel life, and every second you, you don't understand that boredom is a, is a crime in it so it's you can't you can't you can't live your life in a mundane kind of way because you don't get much of it 
Yeah, yeah it's a good point. Boredom is a... I've never actually heard it said as succinctly as that boredom is a crime. Um, Just, um, you know, again, it's so the last question on the book for now. Um, how, how does this sort of push you in new ways compared to your work? Obviously, again, your band work, Goldblade, uh, and also, obviously, you know, Louder Than War, things you've done in the past. You know, how does pulling a book like this together and the books that you are also working on right now how does that push you in new ways do you think as a as a as a person and as an artist oh it's actually he who fears death cannot enjoy oh, life you found it there you go good yeah, yeah i just had a quick google for it yeah it's really <clears throat> and, 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 and so in a way it's, i would say it's he who embraces death cannot cannot uh enjoy life so you know it's that the idea of understanding you know the whole thing and i think it's a great thing and i think it's profound and i think it's it's a core of all great art to to understand that you know all, all great art is about death and it's all about life as well you know and all the all the different parts of life you know you you cannot um you cannot crunch creativity into tiny little things you can't make it just why well, can't they have just like nice things you know but mm. you know life could be nice it could be it's all the extremes you have to understand all the extremes and embrace all the extremes that's what makes great art so uh, going back to the book thing um yeah well it's, I think doing the book. And, and doing the book with that intensity and that kind of detail mm. is, I mean, it, does it affect anything else? But that's the way I always approach things. I mean, the last two Membranes albums were similarly huge projects. You know, there were two double albums that took ages to make and and were a lot of detail in them, which I guess most people never really bothered with <laughs> when they got, which is fair enough, isn't it? Because you're, you're only doing for yourself, don't you? You make records and... It's, I know everybody says that, but it's quite, it's, it is kind of weird when somebody else actually listens to it and actually likes it. You think, oh, God, actually, somebody actually bothered with this. You know, and, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think everybody does that. And I think everybody who makes, probably everybody in, in the book that I wrote about was the same. They, I mean, some of them actually cracked the code to pop and had proper hits, but I don't think any of them ever sat down to be pop bands. They just, they just made arts and sometimes, somehow they managed to crunch the art down to three minute pop songs, which to me is completely genius because I don't think, I mean, I think as a cult band, as I am in a cult band, and I'm cursed to be in a cult band. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think, um, I don't think it makes it higher art just because nobody buys your records. You know, it's it's just there's something really amazing about somebody who can make something that is very dark and heavy and profound, but somehow make it into a piece of pop music. I think that to me is the highest piece of art possible because I love the idea of populist and I love the idea of taking underground esoteric ideas completely into the mainstream. Never underestimate what the public can listen to. It's only the mainstream media do that. They assume that people can't handle a dark piece of music or a heavy piece of music or a clever piece of music. And of course people can, you know, people aren't stupid. They just don't get the opportunity to hear this stuff. They're just pulverised with Saturday night culture, you know, Um, Mm. but but there's, there's so much more you can have to, you know, why don't we widen everything out? But, you know, there's, What's the terror of, of of having stuff that's more interesting? Yeah, what's the ter- yeah? That's interesting, actually. Yeah, because it, it it sort of challenges and pushes people, I think, to to think differently. And I mean, that was the 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 whole, I guess, you know, wider conversation around goth is like, you know, for for someone like myself, you know, that was a huge part of my youth because it because it looked different, and I already looked different anyway, growing up like walking around with two sticks and stuff. So it goes back to that point of like, it's about challenging. And and and, and I think there's something really exciting about that. And, and hopefully people will uh, see that and, you know, through the book. Um, again, I'm very excited for it, mate. And I think, um, I, you know, I do want to move on to ask about, you know, because of the things you've done, because of this book and because of, you know, your previous work, again, you mentioned their membranes, Goldblade, all the musical projects, as well as Louder Than War. And um, for any aspiring authors, writers, and musicians now in 2023, what 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 have you what advice have you got? What key tips would you have if you were sat in front of say a group of students right now? What would you say to them if they wanted to not necessarily, you know, go not certainly not copy you, but certainly emulate some of the success you've had in your career and just be creative in that way? I think um and this is not careers advice because <laughs> this is just an art way of looking at it. But if people ask me how to write for my website, I just say, why are you asking me? <laughs> surely, surely you know how to write about music. You know, it's, you can't, I, I, I don't, I mean, it's good to go to courses to understand how to do stuff. You know, you can learn 
practical things. But I think art music writing is kind of weird, isn't it? It's not like normal writing. It's it's not for, there's no formula, is there? It's some of the greatest music writing. You you never get on a, on a conventional journalism uh, no. job writing like a music writer. It's it's completely anarchic. You know, it's some some of the greatest music writing ever is doesn't follow any it doesn't even follow any rules of grammar. It's it's about a feeling. It's a splurge of words, isn't it? Because you're trying to describe music and what it feels like. You're not writing mm. often. You're not writing facts down. You're just writing down feelings and. Often the only thing I would tell people is to actually go more like that, more you know, more right by feelings. You know, don't don't list. You don't need the whole set list. You know, it's what does it feel like? What's it like being in that room? What did, what was you know, what are the people in the room doing? What did it make that make you feel like? What was the music like? You know, it's it's a bit more beyond. It's almost spiritual, and it's more. You try to write about stuff that's almost impossible to write about, but you can write about it because you just describe. I think you take the barrier down, let the words tumble out, you know, when it's free form, it's actually better, you know, like the beats, you know, like they're, they're on it, weren't they, in the 50s, like with Kerouac and, and you know, and Ginsberg and those people, that thing when they, when they, they splurge the words out, it's mm. probably the best way of writing about music for me. But, you know, if you're trying to get on The Guardian or something to write about music, that's totally not the way to do it. But I'm, I can only tell you what I think. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. I've I've got a range of takes uh, from from different uh, journalists over the years, and I remember like uh, fairly recently, Ian Winwood said to me like the the problem I think with music journalism from sorry he thinks with music journalism these days is people are doing too much to please like PRs and things like that, and you've obviously got to do that to a certain extent if you want to build something. But you know, I guess it's it's an interesting thing if you write well. well Go on. You don't, you don't particularly because I mean, obviously, it's good to be polite to people. PRs have a job to do as well, and they're really stressed out. They're trying to hit mm-hmm. targets, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's okay. You know, it's it's still, you know, you it's can't, you don't, yeah, yeah, you, you don't be rude to them. That's pathetic. But the same time, you don't have to write about everything they send you. You know, it's not your job to write about everything they send. You know, you can only write about the stuff you like. I mean, I think there is criticism often that people don't slag things off. But I'm not, I'm not interested. In that. Does anybody really care what I think about? Coldplay's new next album. It's not important. I've got time. It takes the whole day to review an album. I, I want to go and wallow in something I really like. I want to find. I, I I want to rediscover something I grew up with, or find something that's new, or find something I don't even understand and try to understand it. That's why I'm interested in. I think that you know, um, you know, I mean, I, I'd rather somebody who's going to write about Coldplay didn't like it to understand why that works for other people I, I'm quite mm. fascinated by that as well you know not the music and not the music doesn't interest me at all but the cultural impact of something like that why, why do they connect with so many people what have they got yeah. that people really find fascinating I'm interested in that I'm not interested in somebody going oh they're really terrible because it's such a soft target you know it's like being a hipster journalist gunslinger <laughs> journalist you know let's go and sh- you know Let's go and shoot down the biggest band in the world or whatever. It's just because because you're so cool that your music taste is obviously better than, than the normal people. Go, don't be such a snob. Go, go and understand why that works for everybody else. I mean, you don't have to even like the record to try and find an understanding of why it works. And while you're doing it, go and find me two brand new things and really turn me on to them because you're right this. So, And we, we've got this really brilliant young writer actually on the side of the novel called uh, Ryan Walker. <clears throat> and, and it's great because he really divides opinions. So he's he writes about a three thousand word review of the Sleeper Mods album. It's completely free form. And right, so people wow. go, people go, what? Well, he's not proper writer. You can't make out a word he's saying. But other people go, wow, he's amazing because he's so impassioned, you know. And it's and the Sleeper Mods love him. I mean, obviously because he loves their record, but also because they love him because he writes about them the way nobody else writes about them, you know. And, and I'm interested in that as one. Well. I think in a way, writing about music is almost like making music. It's you know the original originality is really important, you know. And, uh, yeah. You know, when you hear something you never heard before, and you, and you go, "Whoa, that's amazing! What, what is that little noise? And how come that's making me feel like that? That's that's amazing." But also with words, you know, somebody write. I mean, I I love words, and I love I like making words up, and I like twisting words around, and you know, and and you know. So it's not it's it's not a, I'm not a journalist. I'm a writer. It's it's a big difference, yeah. you know. It's, yeah, it's um, a good point. It's a very good point. A proper journalist writes in succinct uh, sentences, you know, and that's a skill, it's a craft. I, I, I can't claim to have that craft. I just describe things with really, with words that maybe are out of context as well, you know. And I just like the sounds of the words and it fascinates me, you know. And luckily for me, um, there's enough people that actually find that interesting as well.
yeah, it's an art. So it's an art form to you, then, yeah. It's an art. To form. me, to me, it's an art. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like painting a picture. It might be a, it might look like a big splodgy mess to a lot of people, but it's a, to me it looks like a work of art. Mm, yeah, no, which is which is awesome, and I think it's different. Actually, it's different because I'm used to speaking to journalists, and of course they've got their opinion. Uh, on on you know on how to get a career in it and whatever or, or or not, but it's actually really interesting to hear someone again who's you've associated with journalism and providing journalistic opportunities to people, but actually you're talking about writing and the the creative art of writing, and I, I quite li I like that job, so I appreciate that uh, reflection in you. Um, a couple more, well, uh, four or five more questions, and now uh, talking, you know, if somebody sees this or listens to it. And you know is is interested in say you know say louder than war is interested in in the work you do like we like we just talked about again you know not necessarily direct advice but they say to I, I what I get a lot John is is well do I need to move to London because we work with a lot of people across Yorkshire we work with people in Lancashire as I know you do as well do you, do you think location matters in two thousand twenty three do you think you need to move to London in as the same way as it was. You know, 10 years ago when I was told to be successful, you had to go and live in these other places, which are very difficult to afford to live in. I just wanted to get your sort of thoughts on that these days. No, no, not at all. I mean, London's got enough writers, you know, and I think um, it's it's a difficult city to live in. It's really expensive to live in. Um, and also, um, there's great music scenes everywhere. And also, because the internet, it doesn't really matter where you are. You know, you could be, you could be in the Hebrides, and where well, there's no gigs, but still write about music because you don't have to go to gigs to write about music. You could be reviewing bits. You can still dredge around the internet and discover new bands by listening to their band camps. Or, you know, so you can sit really far on the outside. And also, um, I think the, the role of a journalist has changed. I was thinking this the other day. We talk about this a bit nowadays. And mm. I don't think me as, I don't think my sole purpose in music culture is to just be a journalist. You know, it's uh if I go and see really good new bands, I actually go and I write them up and I send that link to people who put festivals on and say, you should put this band on at your festival. Or I, or I ping it off to other bands and say, this band's great. Or, yeah. or you know, you should get them to support you. You know, I think you're I a connector. Yeah. You know, I think you're, I mean, I think you always were in a sense. I think when I used to write for music papers, if you wrote a rave review or something, like getting onto Nirvana first, you turn other people, People to Nirvana, and you started the buzz, you started the fire. But now you could do that even more proactively with the internet, and also because you've been around a bit, so you've got a lot of contacts, so you can get in touch with people mm. and tell them about things, you know. And it doesn't always work, you know. Not not everybody's going to get into your stuff, are they? You know, but um, but but you can join things together, make things happen. So you become a catalytic um, yes. influencer in a sense, you know, directly by doing stuff behind the scenes. And that's why I do a lot of the green stuff. You know, I join people together. I introduce people. I say, why don't you speak to that person there? Go do something. I think, I think that's important as well. Somebody's got to be the connector to get things going in the first place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love that as the role of the connector, and I, I resonate with that quite a lot, John. So, again, lovely to hear your passion for connecting uh, people as well as new bands. And it strikes me that you've not lost – you've never become jaded, have you? You've never you, – you've, you've toured around the world – You've written about loads of bands. It's never you, you've never you never become jaded, have you? With it, you seem to just constantly have this enthusiasm, which is pretty cool. Well, there's always, there's always something exciting going on. I think that's really weird. You get people say, and um, the music was only ever got any good when there was. I spoke, I spoke this guy in the gym today. I got saying that as well. So when we talk about punk, you go, oh, you're into punk. I was into punk, you know, when I was sixteen. It's the only good music ever made. I was going, well, it was great. It was amazing at the time. I'm not going to say it wasn't, but. Don't think it's weird that the only great culture ever made by the human race happened to be only when you were sixteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like it never happened before, or, or it didn't happen afterwards. It's only because when you're a teenager, everything's more intense. But it doesn't stop uh, culture being good when you're in your sixties. You know, you can still hear things that you go, "Wow, God, that's pretty brilliant." It connects you in a different way. It's not going to change your life. That, that's just a bit too weird, isn't it? But, <laughs> but, you, but you can still hear it's a piece of music and go, "Wow, God, that's fantastic." I mean. Stole that great band, Hot Wax, in that, you know, um, three 19 year old women from Hastings. It's kick ass kind of grunge bands, but they've added something different to it. They've got little proggy elements in there, really brilliant musicians and really good songs. And they're just on the on the breakout now, you know, and it's, you know, and well, you know, that thing where everyone goes, oh, Glastonbury hasn't got any women headliners on. Well, 
don't write the article. Go and find some headliners and start pushing yeah, them. You know, if, if you're yeah, if you're if you're writing for the Guardian, you've got a really big platform to actually create a band, to hype a band up to get to the stage where they could get half of the bill next year and up to headline or second the bill the year after. You can make those things happen. You have the power to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe in the positive. I think, you know, I mean, it's it's, it's good to call people out, da da da, and that and that kind of thing. But also, mm -hmm. let's provide a solution. You know, don't. Don't just try the criticism. Let's get the solution, you know. And I think people are, people genuinely are trying to make the solutions to everything that's in the culture. You know, like the government, we have one of the most rotten governments of all time. But it doesn't mean the country is totally fucked because there's yeah. people actually doing really amazing stuff in this country. Um, and they, it's like we're doing it again. It's, this is the thing. We're doing it without their permission. We don't need their permission. It's like it's like having your own website or printing your own book or making your own record. Yes. You could actually create culture without anybody's permission but you can also change the uh change the country change the narrative without anybody's permission we don't we didn't need to sit for boris johnson or his or, or any of his corrupt pals mm. to um make the work the country that we want we just get on with it anyway you know I yeah. mean, that's a that's a very northern thing isn't it as you know <laughs> yeah yes. <laughs> yes indeed I, I love it mate honestly i I will take a lot from this, and I hope other people will too. Um, two more then before we do the plugging bit, um, uh, where we do the, the the press and promo. Um, I would like to ask you um again another question I get quite a lot, and I wonder if you've ever had it before. Is a lot of young people go well, you know, they will look at you and they'll go, well, I'm never going to be able to tour with the membranes. I'm never going to be able to do Goldplay. I'm never going to be able to 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 write you know a platform as well respected as Louder Than War. You know, I'm never going to be that successful. And so I wonder, how do you define success? And, and what, what do you think about success? Do you think much about success and your success through the years? And does it does it dominate your thought process a lot? Or, you know, what do you think about, you know, when you know if somebody comes to you and says, well, I can't be that successful, what would be your reply? It's about survival, really. It's about creating the space to be creative in. I think that's, that's success, isn't it? I mean, I mean, if you start, I mean, I know people have been really big bands uh, and it's always that thing you get, you get number one the indie charts in the old days, so you want to be number one the normal charts. Great, got that. What about number one in America? <laughs> it's like, and then your next track comes out. Oh, I want to see better than the last one. It becomes like a circle that just that it's just really difficult to um, to sustain. And, you, know, you know, it's even the Beatles ran out of success in the end. So, I mean, it's it's, it's good to make. Um, you know, it's good to it's good to aim to get something to as many people as possible. You know, never never shortchange yourself but say the, the realistic bottom line is just having a space to be able to be creative in for all your life really i mean you know is are any of those things i do actually that successful in real terms it's not really you know i mean loud and war is it's a great platform but it's not pitchfork i mean pitchfork because they start off with a million quid they can get they can make their platform a lot bigger you know we started off with well nothing really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just built, built it up from there you know which in a way is another kind of success, isn't it? And, you know, some people have written for us gone on to do really well, which is a success as well. You know, it's, it's been a it's been a place where people can use a little trampoline to get on with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, actually, it's made me rethink made me rethink how I look at some of the stuff I've done as well. I appreciate that uh, perspective, uh, mate. Um, another uh, sort of word association uh, before we, we wrap up. Do you think much about legacy? Uh, as a term do you think much about your legacy as an artist do, you know i suppose it relates a little bit to the success question but you've done quite a bit and you will continue to do more bits i am sure so do you think much about from day to day about the legacy of, of john rob and, and what you've been able to achieve in that no nah, i mean it's pointless isn't it because my other big passion is science and i love the universe and the idea this it doesn't. It all, it's all doesn't mean anything, you know. Yeah. It's stuff you do, you do for the now, don't you? And you know, it's in a hundred years' time, no one will care. No, we'll all be forgotten. You know, who knows? Who knows about somebody who reviewed a Charles Dickens book in <laughs> in <laughs> yeah. the nineteenth century? It doesn't no one cares about it anymore? You know, I mean, his stuff survived, doesn't it? But he won't be around in a thousand years. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. Does it matter? Not really. Then only what one tiny little planet. In a universe that goes on forever, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. But it's of the moment is what's important, isn't it? You know, feeling back into the moment, and yes. you know that's 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 the thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, very much. 
Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting perspective, man. I get a lot of deep answers to that, but that I, I can I can resonate with that for sure, man. Um all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably uh it's this is a stressful question for you. You mentioned the bands that challenge you, the bands that you want to go and listen to that really get your, you know, that you want to be challenged by and, and that you're passionate about. And I, I want to ask you, as you know, as I'm sure you get this a lot, but what are the bands that you go to when you really want to be challenged as a listener, as a fan, two, two or three bands of the moment that you are just just so invested in not just sonically but just you, you know the, the vibe the whole vibe are there any bands that you really love and are really invested in at the moment that you want to share what new bands or whichever i'm gonna i'll leave the floor to you on that one i initially started the question with new bands but bands okay well i've got i've got a good one here this um this is duo from poland called sixa s-i-k-s-a Mm. and uh, basically uh, the guy goes there and he plays 45 minutes, just jams out of the bass, and she just ramps down the mic non-stop, just free-forming stories. They, they actually do have a little narrative. It's all in Polish, I don't know what it is, but you look it up, it goes quite an interesting angle. And she goes in the crowd and just stares in people's faces and really challenging, but also really mesmerising, and I think they're really great. I've I, I I saw them about four or five years ago, and then I saw them again the other week. I thought, oh god, that's I've completely forgot. I've sort of forgotten about them because of the pandemic. And I thought, and then it, and they're even better now when I've seen them. So I'm trying to get them hooked up to come over to the UK. Mm. So yeah, I mean they're challenging, but also and um, there's something goes beyond. It's not. I mean, I love you know I love pop songs, I love music, and I love simple songs. But also something about a 45 minute free form ja uh, jam in Polish with somebody just shouting down a mic can actually be really engaging. And it's a challenge, but it's it's an engaging challenge, you know. Yeah, man. So there you go. That answers that, answers that perfectly, it actually. Does, it, it does. <laughs> I love that, man. I love that. We'll definitely plug them. All right. So obviously people are going to be checking out The Art of Darkness. They're going to see your Killing Joke, your Cure, all those bands that, you know, about house that defined, you know, a, a style and a movement. So what records for, for people that maybe check out your book for the first time and they go, wow, this is fascinating. I love this. I'm going to check this out. What rec what are your, what are your top one or two goth records for, for people to check out and why you would recommend? Okay. Them? Well, here's a caveat because nothing, nothing was written as a goth song, but I would say it, the quintessential classic is Bela Lugosi's Dead by Bauhaus. Um, because, because it's, it's got, it has that balance between quite a spooky atmosphere, but also, it's kind of almost tongue in cheek at the same time. It's a very clever balance. It's hard to get that exactly right. It's you could dance to it, but it's also very. It's eight minutes long, and it's it's a dub. It's the dub track as well. It's very dubby, moves around. Mm. Maze guitar playing from Daniel Ash guitar player. It's always cool or weird noises. Uh, the singer Peter Murphy's vocal on it is is ghoulish, but also completely enticing. Uh, they wrote it in the first rehearsal when they formed the band. That's mind blowing. And they recorded it three weeks later as a demo, and that's the song you hear now. And it, you could not get any more of the moment than that, could you? And it's like yeah. a, you know, and for a lot of people, it's, they call it the first goth record, but Bauhaus didn't think they were in terms of doing goth when they wrote it. But it's, um, yeah, so, so I think that if you really had to boil it down to one track, that's the track. Also, Massive Attack do a great cover of it. And Massive Attack... Uh, 3D from Master Attack got really into dub from listening to that track when he was a kid. So th that was his route into Massive Attack from there. And in a way, I mean, Massive Attack, I did write about them a little bit in the book. They are, in a sense, got post-punk golf. You know, they, they're very, they have dark and they're moody and mm. they're kind of an extension of it. They, they kind of mix different things in there, but they, they you know, you can see it. You know, and that's what's quite interesting because goth does appear everywhere. It's, you know, it's it's so embedded in our culture now, it's almost invisible. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, again, a fascinating look and I, I'm so excited for people to, to check out the book. And again, thank you for sharing so much of your insight uh, today, John. I really appreciate it. Before we finish, we've got to do it. Is there anything that you feel like I've missed that you would like to plug and like to promote? You've got more books coming out, but I'm going to leave it to you. Anything you want to plug and promote? Well, I guess currently we should just, people should go and look out for the Art of Darkness, the History of Goth, because that's what we're trying to talk about here. It's, it's on my band camp, it's Waterstones, Amazon, it's everywhere, really. Yeah. 
Nice one, nice one. Good bit of plug in there, John. And again, pleasure to see you again, mate. It's been an absolute joy catching up with you. Thank you for your time. No, I likewise. Thanks for yours as well, yeah.